New York City is full of things to see and do, but these days, well, coronavirus. The pandemic has brought so much to a halt, including tours of iconic landmarks and historic neighborhoods. I'm George Bolarkey, and this is Cityscape. I recently talked with tour guide Jeremy Wilcox about how the coronavirus outbreak is affecting him and others in the industry. Jeremy is a lifelong New Yorker and treasurer of the Guides Association of New York City. We chatted via Zoom. Jeremy, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Oh, thank you for having me. So how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted tour guides like yourself? I mean, we are completely shut down. I mean, we are far, far from the only industry that's been shut down, but you cannot have tour guides if you do not have tourism. And there is no tourism besides the fact that you have, you know, travel shutdowns. People from Europe can't come here. The museums are shut down. Uh, pretty much any place that we would normally bring our customers, like the Statue of Liberty, the 9-11 Memorial, that's all shut down. So, you know, our entire industry is, was literally shut down overnight. And certainly our, you know, all New York City tour guides understand there wasn't like a, why are they doing this kind of uh, thing? But, you know, it doesn't mean that the economic hit and the personal hit isn't felt uh, equally hard. How early on did the coronavirus outbreak begin to hit the tour guide industry? Were you seeing signs of this before the rest of us as fewer tourists started to come to New York City, especially international tourists? Yeah, I would say our industry started feeling this probably the end of February. That's when cancellations started coming in. Um, that's when there started being internal discussions over whether things would shut down. Um, but I would admittedly, and, and you know, this may have been our mistake, but we were sort of following the cues of the city government here in New York and our mayor and even the governor here in New York were just saying, oh, don't worry about it. You know, it's not a big deal. Just keep going out. And so we were like, well, you know, they're the people in charge. They've got the information. If they say to keep going. So we just kept going. I mean, most guides I knew were doing tours through the second week of March. Uh, my last date that I did a tour was March 11th, uh, which was a Friday, if I recall, and most guides were working through that week. And then it was at the end of that week where it became clear, like, no, that everything's shutting down. It's over with. Um, I remember I was actually at the opening day of the edge uh, at Hudson Yards when that new observation deck opened. And you, they were, it was a total celebration, and they, you know, there was so much, frankly, denial going on that week, and then it was open for two days before it finally shut down. How challenging is this for tour guides? How financially debilitating is this? It's been extremely financially um, ruining for a lot of guides because, you know, there is this misconception, I believe, to a lot of people that guides are hobbyists or part-timers. One of the questions I get so often from my own customers is, what's your job? Hmm. And I'm like, no, 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 you're, you're seeing it in action. I'm a tour guide. And they say, no, 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 I get that. But what's your real job? It's sort of seen as like a thing that maybe retirees or college students do on their free time for a little bit of side money. For most of the guides, certainly the ones I know, this is their full-time job. This is their income. Many of them are the sole primary you know, money makers for their household. And when you're not working, you're just not working. And then the struggle was because most guides in New York City are freelancers, contractors, 1099 gig workers, et cetera. You know, we have not traditionally been eligible for unemployment benefits or anything like that. The CARES Act was a great boon to us, but I'll be frank, that's been completely useless, useless to most guides I speak with. Almost every guy I've spoken with has not seen one penny yet mm -hmm. uh, from their, you know, special pandemic unemployment assistance they were supposed to get from the CARES Act. It's been a complete, frankly, failure on the part of the state government and the Department of Labor. How much would you estimate New York City tour guides have lost since the city went on pause? So the Guides Association of New York City has been tracking this. Once reality set in during that second week of March, we really became very proactive and we got to work right away. So we set up a database where we asked New York City guides, not just the members of our association, but any New York City guide to put in their cancellation data we immediately started getting the equivalent of millions of dollars worth of cancellations. We've extrapolated that data and we estimate, you know, at least $30 million in lost revenue for tour guides alone, you know, not even counting the rest of the impact to the tourism industry, hotels and restaurants and things like that. So yeah, I mean, millions and millions of dollars guides have lost since the beginning of March. Is there any type of assistance out there, a special fund for tour guides even, 
there's no special assistance. I mean, there's like small business loans and, um, you know, you, there's so many companies offering these type of loans. You know, Facebook was offering small business loans, uh, the Small Business Administration. Most of the guys I've spoken with haven't really gotten anything from that. I mean, there's so many small businesses applying. Uh, but nothing specifically for guides. I mean, the main hope that most of the guides I speak with, and I include myself, are pinning our hopes on is this pandemic unemployment assistance, um, which every guide I sort of know for know has applied for, and almost no one has seen that pan out yet. What's a typical day look like for you now? Um, I mean, luckily, my work with the Guides Association keeps me fairly busy. Um, I'm certainly waking up later than I'm used to. I'm actually much more of a morning person normally. I usually get up around uh, 6.30 or 7, and but nowadays it's usually an hour or two later. Uh, and I'll sort of just check the news. Uh, like a lot of people, I'm sort of stuck in the news cycle. Um, and then I'll catch up with my emails. And then it's a lot of checking in with my colleagues. I, you know, it's, it's good to have the internet. Like, you know, as much as we're struggling now, I you remind people, 102 years ago during the, uh, the 1918 pandemic, people didn't have Twitter, they didn't have Zoom, they didn't have Facebook, they had no way of knowing how their friends and family were doing. Um, so we're at least lucky in, in that regard. So it's a lot of like checking in with people and with my friends. We, we talk every day virtually. Are you seeing innovation among tour guides that they're doing more virtually as well? Yes, that's been one of the most heartening things um, and one of the main ways where the Guides Association has been working to be proactive is I noticed very early on that some of our members were creating virtual tours, virtual experiences, um, online slideshows, online lectures that they were putting up on YouTube or their websites. And I realized for the time being, this is not only a way to potentially make money, but just to let the world know that we're out there to maintain you know, our visibility. Um, and that's something that, you know, the Guides Association was working on is, is, you know, putting ourselves online through virtual experiences. And we've really been encouraging that. Uh, just in the past 10 days, we've done two virtual professional development programs, PDPs, for our members to teach them how to create these type of things, how to market this, and how to put themselves online for the time being. Yeah, I would think just because people can't physically come to New York, if they're from out of town, they still want to visit New York, and you can provide that opportunity virtually. Yeah, and, and you know, certainly it's not just guides. I mean, the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, and just countless other cultural institutions, the New York Public Library, they're putting so much of their content online. So New York is open virtually, uh, if not in person, and certainly it remains open in spirit. And more and more guides, like every other day, I'm getting a message from one of our members being like, hey, I created this YouTube video or I created this slideshow or I'm, I'm doing a virtual tour, uh, uh, you know, next week about, you know, New York City sports and baseball. Like, can you let people know about it? It's really great. I think people are embracing the new virtual world. Oftentimes, that's what inspires someone to come to New York. For a lot of people, their first introduction to New York City is in a movie, maybe something like when Harry met Sally or something along those lines. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, the thing about New York versus almost any other American city is when people come here, they already know the city. They've seen it. You know, they've seen Central Park already. When I do Central Park tours a couple times a week, and I see this immediate recognition at, at certain spots of, oh, I saw this in this movie, or I remember this, uh, you know, it could be a movie like When Harry Met Sally, or it could be, you know, an action movie like John Wick, or they, oh, I know this block from Ghostbusters. And, you know, it's really amazing how familiar people realize they are with New York from the, you know, hundreds and hundreds of television shows and movies that have been here. And we're sort of approximating that experience. We're saying, let me virtually walk you through New York. Let me tell you about its stories. Let me, you know, show you its historical people. And that can really give them an idea of, you know, wanting to come here, but also give them an idea of what they want to do when they get here. Now, Jeremy, you yourself are a lifelong New Yorker, right? Yes, uh, I grew up in Queens, New York, a fairly sleepy neighborhood called Richmond Hill. Uh, now I live in Flatbush, Brooklyn. Did you always grow up with an appreciation for the city? What inspired you to become a tour guide to want to show other people this city? Oh, I fully admit growing up, I had very little appreciation for my city. And I would argue that's a trait that most New Yorkers have, unfortunately. Um, in fact, if you talk to New Yorkers, your average New Yorker about tourism stuff, like going to uh, the Botanical Garden or going to the Statue of Liberty, they're like, oh, that's that's stuff for tourists. That's not for me. I'm a New Yorker. I don't, I go to my office and I go to my neighborhood and maybe I visit my friends and that's it. You know, my local, my local bar. Um, and most of my life I was the same way. And then 
I had this epiphany maybe about 10 years or so ago where I was like, this is a very expensive city to live in. And if you're not going out and doing these things, it's kind of a waste. You know, you could be living in the suburbs and commuting in and getting a much cheaper cost of living if you're going to be in the city. So I just started exploring the city and reading about the city, reading lots of books, going to every museum and cultural institution. I've made it a goal to walk in every neighborhood in the five boroughs, and I've been sort of making my way through that. And then I would just start telling my friends and dragging them along on these walks and, and telling them about all the stuff I discovered. And they were like, you should charge people money for this. And I'm like, that's not a thing. And they were like, yes, it is. That's what a tour guide is. And that's when the light bulb went off in my head uh, about you know five or six years ago. It's not so easy to get a license to be a tour guide, or at least the exam isn't so easy, I understand. It's pretty hard. Yeah, it's 150 questions. Um, most of them are, are you know, multiple choice, so it's not you know, super difficult. You're not having to pull the answers out of your head. Sometimes it can frankly be a little process of elimination. But yeah, it's 150 questions, and it's a very good variety of questions they have in there. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously right now there's a struggle where people want to get that, but the, the exam must be taken in person in the offices obviously shut down but um that actually made me prouder when i found out there was a test because many cities you know to get a license to be a tour guide you just fill out a form you pay a licensing fee and boom here you go and they just hope that you know your stuff uh i'm really proud of the fact that new york is one of the top cities uh in the united states that really requires you to prove that you know at least a basic level of information before you take money from tourists to show them around which yeah, you don't a, even I, just need to know, though, the history. You also need to know the mass transit system pretty well. Mass transit system, you know, you need to know different type of ethnic foods um, because a lot of tour guides work on buses, both double-decker buses, but also coach buses. You need to know bus parking regulations, so you're not getting in trouble with the law in that way. Uh, you need to know where things are. You need to know, you know, names and information. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot um, because, you know, one of the things I tell people, uh, other guides, is, you know, you may say, oh, I only do this one type of tour. Well, your customers are going to ask you questions about other things and you need to be able to give them the information because the way we see ourselves as tour guides, we are the ambassadors to the city. We are more involved with people's day-to-day -to -day tourism than the concierge in their hotel or a hostess at a restaurant. So we really need to be the ambassadors for the city and people need to have faith that we know what we're talking about. Jeremy, you mentioned the fact that entrenched Native New Yorkers don't necessarily go to see the Statue of Liberty. They're not rushing to see the Empire State Building necessarily. But how much is your industry going to need to rely on locals to keep it afloat once these restrictions ease? Because we might not see international or even you know, domestic tourism grow anytime soon. Oh, for the foreseeable future, you know, almost 100% of our business is going to come from local customers. Um, from some of the forums I see where I interact with international tourists, the earliest some of these people are planning to come is around the holiday season um, because no one can predict when those travel restrictions will be lifted. Domestic travel from other parts of the states might return in the fall, but really at least, I mean, I'm talking at least through the summer, it's going to be local customers. That's why the Guides Association... We're going to be launching a new sub website and project uh, later this month called Tour Your Own City. And the explicit outreach there will be to local customers, people from the city and, you know, the general tri-state area and saying, hey, you probably have for most of your life sort of taken this city for granted. These, you know, restrictions have been lifted. Let's go explore it. Let's help you literally tour your own city. You know, your economy needs you. We need you. And let us show you this city. Let us show you all these hidden treasures. A lot of the customers I do get on my tours have been locals. And one of the best compliments I get is when I get someone who's a lifelong New Yorker, some guy's like, oh, I grew up in Bay Ridge. I, you know, I lived in the city my whole life. You just told me something about this place I've walked by a hundred times that I didn't know before. And that's good, a big part of the goal of the Tour Your Own City project. What are among the off the beaten path places you like to take people to? Uh, one of the tours I like to give is nearby where I live. I, I've done this as a virtual offering a couple times since the uh, pandemic started. It's called my Victorian Flatbush Tour. There is a section in here in Flatbush, Brooklyn, uh, that was developed right at the end of the 19th century. These huge, beautiful, grand, massive homes, these mansions on these beautiful, you know, mall-lined streets with trees. 
that was really developed to be like the antidote to Row House and Brownstone Brooklyn. Um, and I love people showing the history of that. Uh, part of the tour covers a historic church grounds, which dates back to the Dutch era of Brooklyn. Um, and you see hundreds of years of history of Brooklyn in just two hours. Um, that's a really sort of very off the beaten path tour that I, I really love to give. How much more do you appreciate your own neighborhood exploring that history, knowing that history? I'm sure that would be true of others who live in that neighborhood who might not know the history of the neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, I have gotten locals on the tour before. Like, I just moved here and I don't know anything about it. And I developed that tour because when I moved to this neighborhood um, back in 2011, I started wandering around and I'm like, this is amazing. You wouldn't think this is, you know, Brooklyn. It, you know, having grown up in Queens, it didn't match what I pictured Brooklyn looked like, which was mostly, you know, Brooklyn Heights or, you know, Park Slope. Uh, and so I decided to create a tour out of that. And that's a big part of how I personally create tours. I walk around and I'm like, I'm interested in learning more about this and I'm a tour guide. Other people will surely be interested in learning more about that. Like a new tour I created, which I haven't gotten to lead because of the circumstances was a tour revolving around the billionaire's row of these luxury super talls in Manhattan. Um, if I, I, my hope is if I find it interesting, other people will as well. What is most interesting about that? What have you found out? About the super talls? Yeah. Uh, just sort of the, the processes by how they were built, not only the new building techniques, but also these very complicated zoning loopholes and regulations that allowed buildings to be built, you know, so massively tall, um, the type of people who are buying into them or frankly, just sort of not buying into them uh, and the sort of controversies around them. It's just sort of, it's, it's an interesting narrative because it's literally changing the New York skyline. Anyone who's looked at the New York skyline a decade, a decade ago versus now knows how different it is and um, I think people want to know the stories of why are those being built how are they being built why aren't they why aren't I seeing lights on the windows at night is anyone living in there etc you mentioned that you lead tours of Central Park what is some of the more interesting history you like to share about Central Park well my tour is sort of filtered through the fact the idea of Central Park as this thing that really changed not only the city but everything we understand about urban landscapes I mean, so I talk about Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Box and their vision for putting this almost rural bucolic landscape in the middle of at what at the time they were building at was a city largely of slums, uh, tenements and slums. And New York City was not the grand global city that we think of it today back in the 1840s and 50s. Um, and the idea of sort of transforming cities through this type of beautiful landscaping which has obviously been replicated around the United States and was inspired by European parks. Uh, that's what I tell about. This is really important. New York City is livable, not just because it's a grid of, of big buildings, but because we do have now places we can escape and breathe in fresh air, uh, places where you can go bird watching, you can go sunbathing. And that, the importance of that type of landscape to a city, that's how I view Central Park. So that's sort of how I present it in my tour. Yeah, even today, it's a respite, although we need to keep separate from each other. It becomes more challenging, but people are still heading to that park to escape, to get out of their apartments. Yeah, and, and you know, th there's such, a, you know, a desperation for that. Um, another place that's relatively close to me here in Brooklyn is Greenwood Cemetery. That existed before Prospect Park here, here in Brooklyn, uh, before Olmsted ever, you know, even thought about landscape design. Greenwood Cemetery was a place where people would come and, you know, picnic and walk around. It was one of the most popular attractions in New York State at one point because people in a city are desperate for that. And I'm, I'm really seeing it walking around uh, now how, you know, people are. I think most people are being good. People are wearing their masks. They're keeping, you know, minimum six feet away for the most part. Um, but people want to escape into nature in the middle of the city. And, and it's, now it's, it's really great to have that opportunity. Are you intrigued by any of the notables buried at Greenwood? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big street art and graffiti fan. So uh, whenever I'm in that section of the cemetery, I always like to pay my respect to uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, you know, there's a lot of famous people there. Leonard Bernstein, uh, Boss Tweed is buried there. Um, not necessarily, there's a lot of just amazing uh, people there. As someone who likes Central Park, um, I like to pay my respects to the grave of uh, Eight, Emma Stebbins, who designed the uh, beautiful sculpture on top of the fountain at Bethesda Terrace in Central Park. So it's, it's just a, it's a beautiful spot and a, a really 
underappreciated part of Brooklyn. You also lead tours of street art and graffiti, don't you? Yes, that's a, a tour I'm really missing right now. Um, and one of the things that, you know, there's so much stuff that we realize just of the normal spring activity in New York City that's just not happening. And spring is a great time for new street art. Artists are creating stuff. Uh, the end of this month is normally a big block party in Bushwick where street artists create murals and there's a big block party. That's obviously not going to happen. Um, so yeah, I love street art because when you're walking around a neighborhood, sometimes it looks all the same. And sometimes you see a mural or a piece of art that sort of just draws your eye. And just one of the many aspects of New York City life that gets you to look up from the sidewalk or from your phone and sort of look at the details of the buildings that you're looking at. What would you say is the most colorful neighborhood when it comes to street art? Oh, by far, New York City street art epicenter is Bushwick in Brooklyn. Um, and most people just think of the Bushwick Collective, which is just a couple of uh, square blocks around the Jefferson Street stop on the L train. But you walk down along the JMZ lines near Broadway. Uh, you walk over toward, you know, near the Montrose stop on the L train. Just the entire neighborhood is built with some of the most amazing street art you'll see. Talented artists from not just all over the city, but around the world creating murals that in some cases I have watched these artists create with their, you know, spray paint. And then I look at it afterwards and I'm like, how do they, how do they do this? I mean, it's a, it's, it's just, it's amazing what people can do with, with aerosol. I, I'm just constantly blown away. Let's stay in Brooklyn, but go to another park and that's Prospect Park, because I know you lead tours there as well. Yep. Um, I actually live just south of the park. So I love to lead tours there. Uh, Frederick Olmsted and Calvert Box considered it their masterpiece. Uh, compared to the Central Park, which while much more famous, they felt more constraints on. Um, and it's just, it's really, really wonderful. This time of year, I'm missing uh, Smorgasburg. Uh, but it's nice to walk around through the ravine and, you know, over by the lake. And it just, it's, it's really a special place. I mean, must be special if the mayor is forcing his staff to drive him 12 miles every day from Gracie Mansion just to walk through it. You also have a World's Fair history tour. What are some of the key takeaways from that tour? So I created that tour because having grown up in Queens, you know, I was always told, you know, tourism is in Manhattan and maybe in Brooklyn. Um, and so I really love the idea of telling people about at one point, you know, two times actually, Queens was the center of the world. We had the World's Fair in 1939. When that World's Fair opened, President Roosevelt was there to open it up. Um, it just was this really amazing thing. And, and I show people the remnants that are there. But I explain like these World's Fairs, you know, they were almost, particularly with 64, they were basically building a theme park that was going to be by design torn down in two years. I mean, if you look at videos or pictures, particularly of the 64 World's Fair, this was probably, a, you know, nicer than Disneyland itself and California was at the time. They built these big theme parks and then tore them down, except for a couple of landmarks. Uh, it's amazing. And Walt Disney himself was a major collaborator on the 64 uh, World's Fair. So I love telling people about the history of that um, and sort of showing people a different side of Robert Moses than they might know, how we sort of use the 39 World's Fair to scheme to turn the old Corona ash dumps into a grand park. He wanted it to be the central park of Queens. And by doing it that way, he was able to get the World's Fair Corporation to pay to have the ash dump removed and cleaned. Um, and just sort of telling people the history of Queens through the history of that World's Fair and getting people to think about Queens a little bit differently. What's your process for putting a tour together? So every guide is going to have their different process. Mine is, uh, I think, sort of first you have to come up with the concept, say, the World's Fair. Okay, that's not in and of itself a tour. Like, it, do, are you just standing in one spot and telling people about the World's Fair? That's going to be a, a really boring tour. So you come up with the concept. You come up with what's the narrative of this tour? What's the narrative arc? Like I mentioned with Central Park, it's about how Olmsted and Vox really rethought about urban landscapes. So once you've got the narrative, then I look at a map and I have to draw out the route because you have to be realistic. How long is this tour? Two hours, maybe it's two and a half. How much ground can you cover? And the key thing I would tell up and coming tour guides is the ground you want to try and cover in those two hours is much less than you think. You're going to be stopping and talking. You're going to be getting questions. You don't want to be moving from one spot to another in such rapid succession that your guests are not taking anything in. Once you've got your route and your sort of narrative, then you plan out at each stop, what am I talking about? You try and find photos from um, you know, a free use archive. 
that you can show people in a book that you could print out and you figure out, you know, where do I want to take them at the end? What is the thing I want them to take away from the tour at the end? And then I would also tell tour guides, as you start giving a new tour, be willing to rewrite entire sections of that tour over based on the feedback you get from your guests. What's the narrative of the Art Deco architecture tour that you lead in Manhattan? So that is largely giving people uh, a context of Art Deco architecture in New York, showing some of them the more famous buildings, point, letting them know how to recognize these different styles of architecture. But the overall sort of narrative of that tour is really about the importance of preservation and landmarking. Um, that's why the word landmark is in the title of that tour, because I want people to think the tour ends at Grand Central Terminal. Grand Central is not an Art Deco building. It predates Art Deco. But Grand Central is the most important landmark in our history because the Supreme Court case in 1978 that saved Grand Central was the key ruling about landmarking in the United States. And so I want people to realize while cities need to adapt and change, prior to landmarking, we lost so much of our history and that is important. And all these great Art Deco things I'm showing people on this tour might not be here if it wasn't for landmarking. And that's why landmarking is important. That's the sort of narrative I go into. How frequently are you coming up with new tours? Oh, well, I probably come up with, you know, at least one or two new tour ideas a month. Some of them I just sort of cancel out in the planning stages. I realize it's not worth it. Some of them I lead a few times and realize that, it, you know, it, it's exciting for me, um, but not for a lot of other people. Um, at one point, I was doing a tour of Gowanus that was more about the industrial history and evolution of Gowanus. Really fascinating to me. Turned out not to be super fascinating to people who are, you know, paying tourist customers. So it's a lot of trial and error, but I'm always trying to think of new tours, um, you know, because it's a very competitive market. I love all my fellow tour guides, but it's a very competitive market. Uh, and if you want to sort of stay at the top of the game, you don't want to sort of just keep doing the same things over and over again. How many tour guides are there in New York City? Uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs says there's just around 4,000 people with active licenses. Uh, I would remind people that a lot of those people aren't necessarily from New York. They're people who come a few times a year, so they're not full-time New York guides. Um, our association has just under 400 members. Um, and so I would say there's maybe around 1,000 or so people who are really doing this full time as their primary job. Um, but there's about 4,000 people with licenses who are doing this in one capacity or another. And the city doesn't have a cap on tour guides like it does on street vendors, right? Not that I am aware of. As you know, if you pass the test, you pay your fee, you can get the license. Again, because I think the city is aware that a lot of people with the license, it's, you know, they're only doing it, you know, very, very part time. But, you know, frankly, the city doesn't care if you're doing it once a month. If you're leading tours, uh, you have to have that license. What's the benefit of being a part of the association? I think I really tell people I joined the association one month after I got my license. Um, and then less than a year later, I was chairing their public relations committee, which I still do. And I was elected to the board a year and a half after I joined to tell people it's really important to be a part of an association like this. Uh, if you're from outside of New York, find one like it in your city. We are, you know, we are the anchor for people people who have traditional employers, they have human resources department, they have anchors in their field, which can help them get benefits, tell them where to go, help them network. Most guys who are freelance, there's no anchor, you know, uh, so you need an association like this. We help our members network, we can provide uh, for extra costs, liability insurance, we provide FAM tours where we lead around the city several times a month, obviously not right now, but we lead professional development programs. We, you know, it's really, I think, I would argue at this point, more invaluable than ever to be a member of an association like the Guys Association, because you can't be out there on your own right now trying to figure this out. You know, most of us who really know this stuff well, we're, you know, we're just learning new stuff every day at this point. And to be a member of the association is to have a team with you at all times who can help. Well, Jeremy, I look forward to you and the other tour guides back out on the streets of this great city and joining one of those tours. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And don't forget for everyone to tour your own city this summer. Jeremy Wilcox is a tour guide and treasurer of the Guides Association of New York City. And that's it for this week's Cityscape. I'm George Boldarki. Our music is courtesy of Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks so much for listening.